Hello there, welcome to another Ted's Notebook in F1 2020. So much has been happening and the season hasn't even started yet. So we've got lots to talk about this week. We have more news on the calendar, how the races are going to look. We have uh, uh, the experience from IndyCar who started their season at the Texas Motor Speedway. We've got news from Mercedes, from Toto Wolff and James Allison, and some interesting little snippets from McLaren, from Williams, and from Alfa Romeo Sauber as well. But the main story, undoubtedly, the renewed push for diversity and inclusivity in Formula One and motorsport as a whole. Uh, Lewis Hamilton, as I'm sure you'll be aware, has heightened awareness uh, through his posts on Instagram and Twitter. If you haven't seen them yet, do have a look. And Ross Braun, the managing director of motorsport for Formula One uh, itself, was on the uh, F1 show yesterday, Monday, and had some interesting uh, things to say. If you didn't catch it, this is what he said. Uh, that Formula One supports Lewis totally, uh, and they are actively looking at ways to improve diversity in the paddock. Uh, Ross continued, it's a greatest, that there is a greater opportunity for minority and ethnic groups to get involved in Formula One in either driving or on the engineering uh, and uh, uh, mechanical side uh, or marketing or any side. Um, Toto Wolf, Lewis Hamilton's boss at Mercedes, said that he was happy and supportive that Lewis has come out and been so vocal. It's positive for Mercedes and Formula One, uh, he said. Now, one idea going around, I like this, is that Formula One could copy what uh, the W Series, the, um, the all-female racing series, uh, has done and a point, sorry, I just walked into a spider's web. Um, I'm in a park, I guess it does happen. Um, and appoint a inclusion and diversity ambassador. Now in the W Series, it's Naomi Schiff. Now Naomi is half Belgian, half Rwandan. She grew up in South Africa. She races under a, a German license, or rather did race uh, last year. Um, she didn't make the cut for a 2020 series, which itself has been delayed for 2021 because of the virus. Um, but she's hoping to get driving uh, again in either 2021 or 2022. There might yet be a birth for her, hopefully, because she's a good driver. And what the W Series have done is have appointed her, uh, she works at the W Series in London as their diversity and inclusion ambassador. And maybe F1, I thought, could do something similar. But in the meantime, to get give you a bit of insight and context on what it's like to be a black driver in motorsport in America, um, Go to your Sky Q box, if you've got one of those fancy Sky Q boxes, um, go there, go through to Netflix and have a look at the documentary called Uppity. Um, now, it's the story of Willie T. Ribs. Now, Willie T. Ribs is an incredible guy. He was the first African-American to test a Indy car and to race in the Indy 500. And he was actually the first black driver to test a Formula One car back in 1986. Bernie Eccleston gave Willie T. Ribs a test in his uh, Brabham team uh, at Estoril, I think it was. And, well, I won't spoil it for you, but um, Willie tells the story very well in the documentary. He was very good and his lap times were excellent um, in, in that Brabham, in the F1 car. Ultimately, he didn't get the drive, but Willie uh, tells the story himself as to exactly what happened and how he might have been the first black driver in Formula One uh, before Lewis Hamilton. So have a look at it. It's very, very interesting. Um, and um, it's called, uh, yeah, it's called Uppity. Uh, and you can get it through uh, Netflix and also through your uh, Sky Cube box um, to get there. Right, talking of IndyCar, they had their first race this year and they gave us some clues as to how Formula One will look this year. Bit different because the way IndyCar did it was that they all started in Indianapolis, because I think that's where most of the teams are, are based, or, uh, well, yeah, the majority, I believe, are, are based there. And they all got on a charter flight, first thing, 5 a.m., flew to Dallas-Fort Worth, um, all got off, they were, they'd all been tested before. Um, then they went to the uh, Texas Motor Speedway, had practice in the morning, then qualifying, and then the race in the afternoon. So it was all done in one day, which is not something that Formula One is going to be doing. And then they had the, uh, had the podium, um, Scott Dixon won, and uh, they all went home. But we did get a 
insight as to what it might look like uh, in F1. So first of all, they were all wearing um, they were all wearing the masks. Obviously, uh, they were all distancing as much as they could. They have fewer people, fewer mechanics in a pit stop, so it was possible for the mechanics to be distanced in pit stops, but I don't think Formula One uh, they will be. But where possible, people were physically distancing from each other. Um, but a few things I thought were interesting from, uh, well, firstly, from the media point of view, the reporter there, so it's presented uh, by three guys and they were in the same commentary box, but they said that they were distanced from each other, but they just cut their three pictures up uh, at the same time. So it looked like they were together, but they were all looking at the camera, if you see what I mean, like they do in American TV. Um, but we never got a wide shot to see how distant they were. It was uh, Lee Diffie, Townsend Bell, Townsend Bell and Paul Tracy. And so they were all looking to camera and talking to each other, but you assume they were like one, you know, the two meters away from, and then uh, two meters away from the other rest, or one meter, whatever the rule is. And then the interviewer, so the American, uh, the NBC me, Marty Snyder, was interviewing drivers. He did a bit, um, was interviewing drivers in the, uh, in the paddock and the, and the pit lane. And he would hold the mic and do a question. And then he wouldn't go like that to try and get the driver's answer, which is very good. Clever Marty, stupid me, because I tried this back in Australia. And believe me, it doesn't work. And I was, um, I was yearning that... Uh, that uh, Steve the selfie stick. I was yearning that Steve the selfie stick had come uh, had come uh, with me. I didn't think of bringing it, and we couldn't find a boom on the end of the microphone to actually do it. So uh, I, just before the interviews, this was in the pen after the Thursday press conferences. It was Lewis, Sebastian, Nicholas Latifi, and Daniel Ricciardo, and I was sort of asking around the sound guys. Has anyone got, anyone got a boom? Because we had to, you know, keep away. So what I ended up doing was saying, okay, so, you know, Lewis, you're looking forward to the race, whatever it's going to be, blah, blah, blah. And then sort of going like that and him kind of stepping, keeping two meters away. My arm is about a meter. Um, and then the microphone, distance of the microphone, it didn't, it didn't really, uh, really work. So what Marty Snyder and NBC did was they had a sound man with a boom mic standing a meter and a half or two meters away from the driver to get the driver's audio so the driver there reporter there two meters and then two meters to the guy with the microphone on the end of a stick and that's the way it's probably going to go in formula one and you might ask yourselves well if formula one's thinking of being in this biosphere where everyone's been tested no one even gets on the plane to go to the red bull ring in austria why we need to keep socially distant. That's because Chase Carey confirmed that if anyone does test positive for the COVID in the paddock, it won't shut the event down and it won't necessarily mean that that team pulls out the way McLaren had to in Australia and the way that Formula One did in Melbourne. So that's because if they can uh, uh, confirm and if they can make sure that everyone has been distancing and wearing the masks, even though they've been, you know, all been tested and been fine coming in, they can make sure that if someone does get it by some strange reason or develops it, then there's been enough precautions taken with distancing and wearing the mask that the whole team doesn't have to pull out. So that's why you're going to see IndyCar did it, and I'm sure F1 is going to do it. And in fact, Mercedes have already sh shown a, uh, a video on there social media of their team firing up a car in preparation from their test, more of which I'll tell you in a second, as to why everybody's still gonna be wearing the masks and social distancing. Um, so that's what's happening there. Now the empty grandstands, there were of course no spectators at the, spect at the uh, Texas Motor Speedway, um, and there aren't gonna be spectators sadly at the Red Bull Ring. Now um, they covered some of the seats in, in Texas with um, some advertising banners and I don't know if they're going to do that uh, at the Red Bull ring. In any case, they have some Red Bull colors on most of their grandstands, don't they? The, uh, the blue and silver quadrants. So they might just leave them as the kind of Red Bull colors or they might just um, uh, frame them out completely. And why that's important is because I felt, even though this was two in the morning when I was watching uh, in the UK or about that, that if you're watching a race with no spectators, it does make you question whether you're, 
it's, it's hard to remind yourself that the race meant as much as a race would have done if the crowd was there. Um, it's a strange thing. When you're watching something with a huge crowd, you know it means a lot to them. So by extension, if you're watching on TV, you know it me should mean a lot to you. Now, if you're watching and nobody's there, obviously you know it means a lot to the people who are driving, and it means a lot to you if you're an F1 fan because you're watching, but you don't have that sort of confirmation from the massive crowd, cheering crowd, that it means a lot to other people while you're watching it as well. So I thought that was really interesting. Keep that in mind for when you watch uh, what Formula One does um, at the uh, Austrian Grand Prix and at Silverstone, uh, of course. But um, it was uh, uh, then there was the podium, um, which was a little bit sterile, of course, because everyone had to keep their, their distance. So there wasn't a throng of people underneath the podium. And I assume there won't be uh, in Formula One as well. So not only no fans on the main straight, but the mechanics uh, weren't really allowed to have a sort of big throng underneath the podium to cheer the guys. So that was all a bit sterile. Um, what else? Uh, what else could the Red Bull Ring do? Yeah. Well, in Australia, the NRL, the, the, uh, the Rugby League, has um, allowed people to upload pictures of, uh, of themselves to be cardboard cutouts in the crowd. Um, didn't work particularly well. I don't know if you saw the story on the internet. Um, some people uploaded pictures of uh, people like Dominic Cummings and um, some even less unsavory people than that. So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know whether... Uh, I think they're, they're being vetted now in Australia. They're, um, they're just having a look at who these pictures are. So there's not... Doesn't, some, some pranksters don't, uh, don't put some uh, unsuitable people in there. But um, uh, I, don't know, I don't think F1's going to go down uh, that route. But uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, so that's what's going to happen uh, there. Oh, the other thing about uh, the IndyCar, which I thought was interesting, was the aero screen. Now, this is IndyCar's version or solution to improving driver head protection. Uh, and it's developed by Red Bull Technology, and it's a titanium frame with five layers of, of protective glass, I think it is, from um, made by PPG, who, who do all this stuff. And um, the only thing, I, th I think it looks good, but it looks a, like half a size too big. Um, I wonder if they're going to do a, uh, a different version of it where it's just slimmed down. It looks a bit too bulbous, just from an aesthetic point of view. And I know it's not an important thing. It's important to be for safety. It looks, you get the, the, the shape of the, of, the, of the car coming out, and then it just looks a bit big. And I just wonder if they just shrink it a little bit, just by half a point or so, whether that might make it look even cooler and still maintain its safety function uh, for uh, for um, indie cars. But um, yeah, have a look. I thought the uh, aero screen was interesting, made by Red Bull Technology. Now, we can start here. And how many races do we have? Because the hopscotch of the F1 calendar is beginning. And I don't know if I can do this uh, with a selfie stick, but uh, what do you have to do? One, so we have Austria, Austria 2 and Hungary, then Silverstone, Silverstone, no, that's not right, uh, Barcelona, and then Spa, Monza. Oh, hello. And that's eight. Now, eight is indeed the magic number because eight races, I know we've got nine and ten here, and look, someone's drawn ten with lots of stars on, isn't that lovely? But eight races is what you need by regulation to make a world championship. And that was the significance of F1 confirming the eight races uh, last week. Because if we have eight races, that's the minimum we have for a championship. But what else are we gonna get after that? Let's talk about that uh, for a little bit. So, um, as I said, it's Austria, Austria, Hungary, uh, Silverstone, Silverstone, Barcelona, then Belgium and Italy. So that does make a championship. Um, but where, go, where do we go after that? Well, it should be Baku and Russia. But Azerbaijan, Baku, is looking a little doubtful. And Ross Braun also talked about this on the F1 show uh, yesterday, where you go City Grand Prix are looking much more problematic in terms of dealing with the crowd and putting F1 into a sort of tested environment, into a city, is much harder than doing it at a sort of permanent racetrack, uh, or at least a temporary racetrack that's sort of out of town. Um, so, so it's looking very... Uh, doubtful whether Baku is going to happen. We ho hope it does, obviously. But if it doesn't, it could mean we have two races 
at the uh, Sochi Autodrome in Russia. So that could be, Russia could be next, two races there, potential double header. Um, then maybe a double header in, in Shanghai at, uh, at the Chinese Grand Prix and whatever they call the second uh, race there, the Shanghai Grand Prix, um, because um, it looks like there isn't going to be a Japanese Grand Prix. Japanese uh, have already cancelled the MotoGP race, which was going to happen a week uh, after the, uh, the F1 race. Uh, in October, so it looks like there isn't going to be uh, a Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka, sadly. Um, very big question marks over Singapore. It looks like they uh, can't have a race in the middle of a town, as we've said already in the notebooks. Uh, Vietnam seems to be that they don't want two races in, in the space of six months with each other, which if it does happen in April next year, would be quite close together. So, uh, so I don't, it, Vietnam looks a bit dodgy as well. And then we get to the US, Canada, doubtful, as is Austin, Mexico, and Brazil, because as Ross Braun said, they're in very different places with, uh, with the COVID-19 than everybody else's. They're a month or so behind, so we just have to wait and see on that. So if the American and South American leg doesn't happen, then it's possible that Formula One could go back to Europe after doing some races in Russia and maybe a double header in China. And Mugello in Tuscany, a track owned by Ferrari, is um, being touted as, as one that could be, because it could coincide with uh, around the time of a thousandth Grand Prix anniversary for Ferrari, which is a couple of races, I think, after Monza. It was going to be uh, around Monza uh, this year with the original calendar. Um, what was it earlier than that? Anyway, um, but uh, it's going to be sometime around that. And they're thinking about Mugello. So Formula One cars and Mugello. Wow, that would be uh, interesting. It's certainly a, a demanding track. It would probably be um, uh, scrutinized uh, to make sure that it's safe uh, for Formula One cars, modern Formula One cars uh, at the moment. But that is something being uh, thought about. But the idea of Formula One cars racing around the beautiful Tuscan circuit of Mugello would be absolutely fascinating. And Imola, if that happens, and maybe even Hockenheim as well. I think there are problems with, uh, with Imola um, in the region that they are in Italy. I'm not sure they allow uh, big events like that, even behind closed doors. But we will see what happens. So it looks like we might have a European season after Russia and China and then go to the Middle East. Bahrain, happy to have two races back to back, and then Abu Dhabi is already signed up to have the season closer. So that would make it up to uh, the other magic number, or hopscotch one, of 15 races, which is more of a kind of, you know, sort of standard uh, Grand Prix season that we used to have um, back in the sort of 80s and 90s. Well, it was sort of 16 races around then, wasn't it? But um, uh, that would make a, a decent, uh, um, a decent uh, calendar and one that everyone thought that uh, you know with allowing for the odd breakdown here and there that people got a fair drivers got a fair and teams got a fair crack at it um, right what's going on yes as I said Mercedes they are uh, deep in preparation for the season Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas we believe are back in the UK because this week they're going to be testing a two-year-old car the 2018 W09 because Mercedes have the capacity to actually run this themselves um, uh, so that's a that's the biggest proper test that it seems that uh, any team and drivers are going to have. The team to practice the new procedures with a mask and the distancing, and the drivers just to get sharp again. A two-year-old car, a championship winner itself, a really good test for the drivers, even though the tyres won't be absolutely the same ones that they'll be using this year, if you see what I mean. Um, it will still be the best preparation, it seems, that uh, Bottas and Hamilton are going to have ahead of the season compared with anyone else, although Ferrari clearly will have Fiorano and some old cars uh, for Vettel and Leclerc uh, to get going in, get some practice in. Um, but Toto did an interview, great interview with Martin Brundle uh, earlier last week and confirmed what we thought in a previous notebook that Sebastian Vettel is currently fifth in line for a Mercedes seat behind Lewis Hamilton, Valtteri Bottas, Esteban Ocon, and George Russell. So those four drivers have to be favorites for the seat, uh, for the two seats in 2021 before Sebastian Vettel gets a look in. 
but Toto confirmed that you have to respect Vettel's achievements and therefore you can't discount him. So I still wonder whether if he's not going to get a driving seat for 2021, whether Vettel might get some kind of Mercedes ambassadorial role uh, or a, or a, or a co team principal because something else Toto hinted at that uh, he was uh, he was staying he wanted to stay with Mercedes but sort of hinted to some other media I think um, that he might have a different role uh, in the team but we will see about that he dismissed Toto Wolff dismissed uh, the rift with Ola Kalanius the uh, the boss of Daimler who took over from Dieter Zetcher him with the, the fluffy moustache said that's absolutely not true and that he's uh, uh, him and Ola have a great relationship and he's a good sparring partner uh, for Toto Wolf um, and was talking about the ATR now Formula One loves its um, three letter abbreviations or uh, uh, mnemonics doesn't it so ERS, KERS, DRS and now we've got ATR ATR is aerodynamic testing regulations what we were talking about uh, in a previous notebook about the the aerodynamic handicap and uh, of, of, of giving the World Championship team less time, a few hours less time per year and less runs in their wind tunnel compared to the midfield teams and anyone at the bottom gets 10 hours more than the top teams. Toto Wolff said that this, wasn't, this was a fine adjustment uh, and he was willing to accept it on the grounds that it was just a fine adjustment to, that, um, to those rules and it wasn't a baseball bat of the reverse grids that had been uh, suggested that Toto wasn't uh, in favour of. Um, we should say Mercedes congratulations to Stoffel van Dorn. He won the Formula E uh, virtual championship for Mercedes. And James Allison had an interesting thing to say on uh, what, another video that uh, Q&A that Mercedes did on their social media channels. He was talking about the DAS. Apparently they thought of it quite a while ago, 2017, 2018. James Allison said they took it to the FIA in 2018 in order to, to have it on the 2019 car, last year's car, but they were told to go away by the FIA and rethink how they were doing it to make sure that it was satisfied the, the rules on steering. Now, I alluded to this in the previous notebook. So it satisfies the rules on steering. If you have a look on the FIA website, FIA.com, go to Sporting Technical Regulations, Formula One Technical Regulations, have a look at Article 10. And there are some rules on steering that the DAS um, satisfies, so Mercedes and the FIA tell us. But have a look at the, the, the rules on suspension. And there's a clause in there that says that suspension can't be changed while the vehicle is in motion. I think that's the one that Red Bull were doubt, doubtful about and wanted to put a, a, a protest in, in Melbourne to see if the Mercedes DAS, the dual axis steering, the thing that actually changes the, the toe of the front wheels while the car is going around a track, satisfies that rule. Because I think the argument was, I think Helmut Marco said this at the time, that changing the toe in angle of the front wheels inevitably will change the ride height of the car. And if it does this, then that will, in a small way, uh, affect the, 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 that rule. It will break that rule on changing the ride height manually in the middle of a race um, by some system. That's the rule they might fall foul of. Are we still going to have, in the Austrian Grand Prix at the Red Bull Ring, Red Bull protesting Mercedes and their dual axis steering system, the DAS? I don't know. We think we were prepared for it. There were lawyers out in Melbourne ready for a protest uh, earlier in the year, in March. There was also going to be a protest, we thought, from Renault about the Racing Point designs and how it was um, essentially a pink Mercedes. Uh, but that never happened, of course, because the weekend never really got underway after Friday. Is this all going to resurface after the, Austri the Austrian Grand Prix or in the middle of the Austrian Grand Prix? Don't know, who knows, but watch to find out because we'll be all over it if it does happen. It'll be quite, a, quite a, another thing uh, to keep across as well. Um, right, just a few other things uh, to round it up. Um, uh, McLaren, uh, sorry, Mercedes, yes, they could redeploy staff so said Toto, in other series. Because of the uh, budget caps, they're going to have a lot of staff they don't really want to lay off. Um, but they could go into maybe World Endurance Championship. Ferrari have already had talks with IndyCar about doing an IndyCar program. So it looks like Ferrari are interested in that. But they could look at the World Endurance Championship as well, maybe with a souped-up Mercedes, and Ferrari could do that as well, which I thought was interesting. Now, Ferrari, Mark Hughes wrote an interesting article in uh, The Race, therace.com, or the hyphen race, um, and that there are two technical directives uh, from Ferrari, which 
uh, who, who are the t two technical directives from the FIA as a result of Ferrari, who've been helping out the FIA on, um, on policing the engine regulations. First technical directive for the teams going to the Austrian Grand Prix and the rest of the season is updated sensors to check electrical power distribution of the electricity generated by the energy recovery system, uh, just to check that the teams aren't diverting electrical power to anywhere that they shouldn't be, uh, which of course they shouldn't be. And the second technical directive is about oil burning, ensuring the oil burning restrictions are kept to. Um, so I guess it's logical, Mark Hughes makes this point, if Ferrari are helping the FIA define these technical directives to all the other teams, it's logical to assume that Ferrari know that they can pass them easily. So is this then Ferrari closing off some grey areas that they think other teams were doing with their power units to make sure that it's a level playing field for everybody. Ferrari, if you like, helping the FIA police all the, uh, the other teams, their rival teams. Well, it seems to be, but we'll have more on it when the season um, gets going. Um, McLaren, Lando Norris has been racing or testing an F3 car to get sharp. I'm not quite sure what Carlos Sainz is going to do, but Andreas Seidel was on the F1 show uh, as well. He's talking about how they'll try to do the same with Carlos Sainz to get him sharp. And um, talking about Daniel Ricciardo, Seidel was saying we have a new reference, a seven time winner and a reference for Lando Norris. And we're very happy with the replacement for Carlos Sainz that we have. That's why we were happy to let Sainz go to um, Ferrari without too much uh, of a uh, of friction. There's an interesting, there's a photo in uh, Seidel's office. You see, you get to see with these Zoom photos, Zoom conferences uh, in this shutdown, um, people's offices. And um, this was driven Ron Dennis crazy. It's the whole McLaren team in their, in their sort of speed mark and uh, hello to McLaren Automotive, if they're watching, um, in their sort of Speedmark logo, standing outside, I think on the helipad outside the, uh, the McLaren Technology Center. But there's one guy who's not wearing black trousers. Everyone's wearing black trousers. One guy standing up in tan trousers. And that would drive me absolutely crazy. Um, I'm a little bit, you know, like that, but in the, not as much as Ron Dennis was. Uh, uh, surely, unless it's his uniform, it's like, no, no, mate, go put some black trousers on. You're spoiling the nice clean look of everybody. But everyone wearing black trousers. But I just thought that was funny. Um, right. Uh, yes, yeah, Sauber. Uh, Luke Smith from Autosport did an interesting interview with Beat Zender, who said that the idea of Kimi Raikkonen going back to Sauber after he ended his um, association with Ferrari was actually dreamt up on Kimi's private plane, which Beat Zender, the Sauber team manager, took a, a, a lift on after Silverstone 2017 and said to Kimi, well, thanks very much for the ride um, back to Zurich. Uh, and if, you, if it doesn't work out for Ferrari, come and join Sauber. And that's exactly what happened. It was quite a nice story. Uh, and Williams, George Russell has done the hat trick. So congratulations to him. He's won three uh, virtual races, Grand Prix, eSports, sim races, whatever you want to call them, in a row after winning the Baku version on the weekend. That puts him very close to uh, Charles Leclerc in the virtual eSports sim championship. Uh, I didn't know there was a championship for this, said George Russell, so he didn't even know that they were putting points together for this, but they are. Uh, and uh, the finale is the Canadian, the virtual Canadian Grand Prix on the eSports next Sunday. Um, but, um, uh, what? Are, oh yeah, Ross Braun was saying, about Williams that uh, he hopes that Formula One can find ways to help keep Williams in Formula One and the changes they've made to the budget cap and to distribute the prize money a little bit uh, fairly for the middle field and, and back of the grid teams will help teams like Williams stay in Formula One. Right, that's it. Um, thanks very much uh, for watching. Um, make sure you catch the, uh, the watch along on uh, on Wednesday. Actually, we've got a good watch along coming up uh, with which is the that, that fantastic 2011 uh, Canadian Grand Prix where Jensen Button stole the lead, spoiler alert, stole the lead from uh, Sebastian Vettel on the very last lap. Uh, so Canada 2011, watch out for that uh, in uh, a week or so's time. Um, but from uh, a sunny park somewhere in North London, I'll say thanks very much for watching and um, well, if there's enough to say, I'll see you next week. Bye bye. Sky Sports F1. Feel it all.